Okay, this video is going to take you through Peter Windsor's analysis of Abu Dhabi 2021. And the reason I'm doing this is the importance of people's education. Everybody that watched Abu Dhabi 2021 live will have seen with their own eyes what took place. They'd have had the broadcaster present their version of what was happening. So the likes of, for example, Sky Sports, um, Martin Brundle and David Croft and all the former drivers, the experts, telling people what they'd just seen and offering their expert opinion. What people then do is they go to another form of media. For example, they might look on the BBC website and read about Andrew Benson um, breaking down what happened and giving that explanation. And some people will go on to social media and look at people's opinions or articles on there or they'll come onto YouTube and look at what the YouTubers are saying about it. Now Peter Windsor uh, is recognised and has this um, kudos as being an expert. He has a history of working in the industry of Formula One. Uh, he articulates himself in such a way that he presents himself as having expertise and he will have. He'll have knowledge due to being in the industry that I don't have in that regard. Um, and people, therefore, feel that they are receiving authentic information. What I do have is approximately, I don't know, somewhere in the region of 35 years, a bit more than that now, of experience of following a sport, spectating the sport, through the ability to analyse what it is I'm seeing. And therefore, uh, whilst it's not insider information, I understand what's going on and can certainly understand the sporting aspects of what's going on, even if I'm, even if I'm not party to the uh, inner workings of what might be going on and the inner politics of the sport. So when I was watching Abu Dhabi 2021, when those last five laps took place, I was watching it with three other people. And when all the hype was happening, I was actually quite calm. And whilst they were all getting hyped up and either excited or hyped about, oh, what's going to happen? Is Lewis now going to lose it? What's happening? I was like, don't worry. As soon as they show us on track uh, how this is being cleared up and where the cars are in relation to that, I'll be able to work out. Uh, whether this is possible to get going and it's only at that point where I'll be worried for Lewis or not because the way this is going I think it's going to be a safety car finish um, but I'll, I'll soon know as soon as they show us and they never did they never did and then when it all unfolded the way it did straight away I said well this can't happen this this is not valid in any way um you, they're going to have to reverse this situation. So even after the checkered flag and all the fireworks went off, I was like, well, no, they'll reverse this. There's a, there's a process and they'll actually end up reversing this. So don't you don't worry about it. That's what they're going to do. Because I know why they have to do it. So in the immediate aftermath, I didn't know all that I've been able to uncover. I didn't know all of the corruption involved. I certainly didn't realise the, the scale of it in terms of what F1 TV were involved, Sky Sports were involved, all the teams were involved, the extent of the FIA corruption. I didn't get all that. OK, that's taken time to drill down to and understand it. But certainly in the immediate aftermath, I could pick out, well, you've just separated out two cars to race off for a victory in a Grand Prix. And you're not allowed to do that. So that in itself makes it invalid. So, you, you know, you, you cannot allow that to stand in that manner. That in itself, you know, we, we knew, those of us that have watched the sport, that that mandatory safety car lap has to be performed beyond the release of the lapped cars. That was enough to overturn the result of that. And that clearly does it. Windsor doesn't say that in this presentation and in the immediate aftermath with his level of expertise he should have been able to do that. So I'm going to take you through his presentation and um, 
it's, there is some good in it, but there's there's things that that as this again presented expert of the sport with the uh, profile that he's got, he should have been able to pick out. Anyway, here we go. Right. Well, I said yesterday that I thought the odds favoured Max. I have to I have to confess, I didn't imagine it was going to work out the way it did. Uh, I think yeah, the thing that astonishes me still is how bad Max's start was from the pole, the clean side of the grid, on soft tyres. And he didn't get the lead into turn one. And thereafter, Lewis drove, and Lewis made a great start, I've got to say, made a great start on the medium tyres. Lewis thereafter drove an immaculate race in every dimension. Uh, and whilst they were sort of sparring and with no traffic around them and it was one on one, Max was consistently three to four kilometers an hour quicker on the straight and Lewis was quicker on every lap that he drove. OK, fair assessment. Lewis's start was great, both on tyres, which shouldn't have afforded him the best start, on the side of the track, which shouldn't have afforded him the best start. And yet he still nailed it and then drove well enough throughout the race. If, if, I don't have the data um, in terms of the straight line speed of the cars, but if it's true that the Red Bull car, Max's car, was three three to four kilometres faster on the straights, and yet Lewis was able to lap faster, which clearly he was because he was pulling away, what does that tell you? Max has got the faster car in terms of outright power. Whether the car handles around corners as well, or whether that's just driver skill, Again, we don't know because we don't know what those cars are truly capable of and what, what's the car, what's the handling characteristics of the car and what is the driver. Okay, But if a car is certainly faster on the straights and another car is setting faster lap times, you'd have to say that there's got to be an element of driver skill in, in being able to lap that car faster if you're uh, not the fastest car on the straights until he got into a situation where it was slightly different tyre wear and tyre situations uh, for both of them. So in terms of Lewis's drive today, absolutely superb. And then he had to defend as well. I'm going to go on about Lewis a little bit initially because I want to paint the picture of what Max Verstappen beat today. He then had to deal, of course, with Sergio Perez. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I always imagined that Sergio was going to be the biggest problem for, Matt, for Lewis going into turn one, even that he was probably going to be very near him and might just tap him at the rear, as I suggested yesterday. But it wasn't that. It was coming up to Perez, who'd stayed out there a uh, very long first run on the, uh, on the soft tyre and going very slowly. And Lewis three times basically passed Perez and three times Sergio pretty aggressive repass. I think the crowd loved it, but it, it was all happening at really slow speed. I mean, in that in those one lap and those three passes, Lewis lost eight seconds to Max. So he had to, Lewis had to put up with that again. Then when that settled, he was pulling away from Max again. When Max got... I'm going to do a different video on this, but Mercedes' strategy was atrocious. I'll take you through it. Um, it will be opinion based rather than facts based because, and I'll explain in that video why. But I felt watching that race live, Mercedes' strategy was atrocious. Now, they didn't get it wrong in those last five laps. I'm not complaining about that. But pitting Lewis at the time they did was appalling. But uh, again, that's for a different video. Got onto the, the hard tyre, and it was basically a one stop strategy race, as we said yesterday. He was, he was about 0 0.1, 0 0.2 seconds of a lap slower than Lewis, again, match for match. And then, of course, there were the other outside factors, the first of which was a virtual safety car. I'm not really sure why it came out. It's something to do with Giovinazzi stopping in the Alpha, but he didn't seem to be on the track. Anyway, it was quite a long virtual safety car. And at that moment, Red Bull brought Max in. And OK, I don't have any issues with the virtual safety car. Ultimately, if there are, if there is a car that needs recovering adjacent to the track, and even if that means Marshall's going out and pushing it, it having the other remaining competitors slow down to a reasonable speed, just for extra safety so that they don't go flying off the track in that location and hitting whatever's going on, even if it's just off track, then that's not a problem. Virtual safety car is actually quite a good thing, in my opinion, because all of the gaps that have been built up are maintained. All you do is you slow everybody down 
but everybody continues around like a carousel. They're all they're all maintaining position and gaps, but just at a slower speed. And that adds in the element of safety to those people that are required to do the work adjacent to the track. So I don't have an issue with that. And Mercedes kept Lewis out. And I think that was the right call because had they brought Lewis in, he's leading the race, Max may well have stayed out and got the lead. And that's what they didn't want to do because they didn't need Lewis near Max because potentially if they touched and both went out, the world championship was there for Max. So that's what Mercedes were always thinking about. And in that context, it was always better to be P2 on the road rather than P1. It's not... I don't understand what you're saying here. In that context, it was always better to be P2 on the road. I don't... I've no idea what you're talking about here. In terms of what you've got the advantage of being able to make that choice. Mm. Sort of thing you normally bring into the into the variables to play with. But being second is always better in that situation. But it isn't the case with the safety car, because with the safety car, of course, the field bunches up at the restart and forget about gaps completely. So the interesting thing is that Mercedes again didn't bring Lewis in right at the end in that safety car. And I think they did that because they were in this mode of not relinquishing track position to Max, because they just didn't want the two to be near one another or Lewis to have to fight Max if Max stayed out. The problem was that Michael Massey, the race... How about you look at the data? If this is this is a data driven sport to suggest that race engineers don't look at how long these things take to clear up would be ridiculous. If each of those teams don't have teams of people analysing safety car situations, analysing the length of time these things take to clear up and therefore how many laps are lost and therefore how you then make your strategy calls with regards to whether to pit your car or not to go on to, to fresh tyres. Because if you don't restart the race, you don't lose track position. That's, th that's as simple as that. That is a basic. So to suggest that Mercedes don't look at the situation, don't assess how long they believe that that situation is going to take to clear up. And when you're dealing with a situation where a car has crashed, it's, be it's set alight, there's been a fire extinguisher let off, there's carbon fibre on the track. It can't just be pushed off the track. They're going to need to get a crane on there to remove it. And then you're going to need to check barriers. That situation is going to take at least three laps to clear. And it, that's what it took. And then you have to do the unlapping procedure. So you look at that and you make the decision that this is going to be a safety car finish. It's a safety car finish. So the reasons you've given Windsor, they're not the real reasons, are they? This director was, I would imagine, under immense pressure in those last minutes when they're out behind the safety car to ensure that this race, this world championship, this title fight didn't end under a safety car, and with an anti-climax, if you like. All this relates to Article 4. That's ridiculous because it doesn't matter what pressure an official is under. They don't buckle to it. If a World Cup final between England and, well, that's being optimistic, England playing in a World Cup final, but we can dream. Um, let's say it's England versus France and a World Cup final is being played at Wembley Stadium in England and 80% of the crowd is English. Do you think the referee is going to be under pressure? Do you think it's a valid um, argument to say, oh, yeah, well, the referee was under so much pressure to give that penalty to England. You could, you could understand it, couldn't you? No. No. That's, that's an official making a corrupt decision. 48.1.2, which states that any cars that have been lapped by the leader will be required to pass the cars on the lead lap 
and the safety car. In other words, before the race can be restarted, any unlapped cars must pass the leader and get back onto the same lap again. We've had that rule in Formula One for several years now. And so Mercedes quite rightly felt that by the time those five cars had passed Lewis and got back into formation, the race would probably be over. It wasn't really a gamble. It was, you know, that was the evidence in front of them. But then it all changed when Michael got on the radio to you know, you've picked out five, you've not focused on the eight. The bit that you've overlooked is the safety car returning to the pits at the end of the following lap. You know, we're not spoken about this. That That's the key thing here. The safety car, once the last lap car has passed the leader in the safety car, the safety car will return to the pits at the end of the following lap. That's the wording of the regulations. I know that shit off by heart now. Okay. That's what this has done to me. The end of the following lap. So you can't release those cars on lap 57 and the safety car come in on lap 57. The safety car returns to the pits at the end of the following lap, which is lap 58, which means it's a safety car finish. Mercedes to confirm that the cars between Lewis and Max, the lap cars, would not be required to pass Lewis. And so either way, it was going to work for Mercedes because then there was one lap to go. Max still had to find a way through those four or five lap cars in front of him. And he probably wasn't going to be able to do that even on his new set of soft tires. That's right. not even an option. Not even an option. This is somebody that, again, Windsor is an expert of the sport. The rules were changed for the start of the 2012 season. How many times have you seen races resumed with lapped cars in situ? Like this. Like what happened in... Like what was suggested could happen in Abu Dhabi with the race resuming with Lewis in front, then five lapped cars and then Max. How many times since 2012 have you seen that happen? And the answer is, you haven't. And the reason you haven't is because the regulations don't allow it. There's not an option in the regulations to allow it. But you're presenting that, you're parroting the narrative. Oh, well, that was an option. That's what they thought that they were going to do. Well, why would you do that? Why would you suggest, well, they could have restarted the race this way? You can't restart the race that way. There is not a single person that can evidence anywhere in the rules or regulations that that is a permissible way of resuming racing. It's not possible. And yes, there are two examples that we can pick out that are, of races where there has been a lapped runner that hasn't unlapped in that time. But there are reasons. They be, they're because those lapped runners didn't meet the qualifying criteria to be unlapped. Those cars in Abu Dhabi, all eight of them met that qualifying criteria to unlap. But then, and this is where the contentious issue now lies, and Mercedes have put in a protest about this, Michael then got on the radio to tell those five drivers to pass Lewis so that Max was right behind Lewis now. But what he didn't do was tell three other lap cars in the race to do the same thing. And so Daniel Ricciardo, Lance Stroll and Mick Schumacher were not given that call. And that for sure is what Mercedes will be talking about. Now, if this was any other race, other... So you've not identified that Carlos Sainz in third became blocked off from challenging those top two positions. That invalidates the Grand Prix. That invalidates, well, I'll say the Grand Prix. The Grand Prix was valid up until the 56th lap of 58. You can declare a result with that duration of Grand Prix having been completed. This is what we do see. You see results declared in a Grand Prix. You see results declared in a two-lap fucking parade. Somebody can win a two-lap parade, and yet they want to void 56 laps of valid Grand Prix racing because two laps, well, the rules were broken on the 57th lap of it. So you should be able to pick out stuff like that. Other than a championship decider, I'm pretty sure that there would be a major issue here. But be Let me just rewind that. Because, again, this explanation is, is absolute fluff. Given that call, and that for sure is what Mercedes will be talking about. Now, if this was any other race other than a championship decider, I'm pretty sure that there would be a major issue here. But because Yeah, 
But it's the thing is, you're saying, oh, if it was any other race other than a championship decider, right? Every race of the season could be a championship decider. If you have 22, 23 races, each of each of them contributes to the outcome of the championship. In a football league season, each and every game you play, you can earn three points, one point or zero points. Each of them points contribute to the outcome. So if you end up losing the league title by one point, was it that you lost that one point on the, the last game of the season? Or was it that you lost that one point in the first game of the season where you lost that game? Or the ninth game of the season where you drew that and you should have won? Where was it you lost the title? It was every single game matters. They're all games. They all contribute in exactly the same way. And the rules are the same for each of them games. Just because it's the last game of the season, that game doesn't all of a sudden get extra time played or a penalty shootout. It's still a league game where you get either zero, one or three points. And any goals that you score in those games or concede get added to your goal difference. That's the way it works. So just because it was a, a championship, no, it was just another Grand Prix. And the points accumulated at that Grand Prix would go to the season long total. And that would determine who was going to win. And what you're suggesting now is, oh, no, in fact, I'll let you, let you listen. Because this is a championship decider, and because all the confetti has gone up and the champagne and Max is now the world champion, it's very unlikely that anything will happen. And so that's why there's this strange feeling after this. Oh, it was wrong. But because they, uh, you know, they sprayed the champagne. Oh, so as soon as, you, as soon as you pop the cork on the champagne bottle, uh, yeah, you can't do anything about it now. What a load of bullshit. You can't give that as a valid explanation. Oh, yeah, because they've given out the prizes for it now, then, yeah, yeah nothing you can do. Just race. But I think it's also the case that, although it was all down to that last lap, the last race, the last lap, in reality, it's been a really long year. And if Mercedes truly want to look at how they lost this championship, it isn't a call that maybe caught them unexpectedly here in Abu Dhabi by Michael Massey. It isn't uh, the eight seconds that Lewis lost to Sergio Perez. I mean, I've never seen anything like that. Perez going so slowly, just ridiculous. And every time Lewis got near him, he almost had him off. Um, I think, I think. Should you be in a Grand Prix where you are being purposefully blocked like that to the point where it is jeopardizing your, um, yeah, it is, it is jeopardizing you being in that race. You, you are having to avoid, take evasive action from another car that if you don't do that, they crush you out of the race. Filthy tactics. If they look deeply into the mirror intensely, it'll be we lost the championship because we didn't have as good a car as the. No, you've gone into that championship, and you are level on points. Why are you saying you didn't have a good, as good a car? You are r r racing that race, and you've got a lead. You're in the lead by twelve seconds. Why are you saying? Oh, the reason we lost was because we didn't have as good a car. You won the constructors championship oh it's because we we didn't have as good a car what are you talking about windsor red bull certainly for the first half of the year so in that in that way you look at it it's got to be adrian newey persevered with the high rate philosophy all these years and eventually now he's won the championship and i think mercedes with all right you're a you're an adrian newey fluffer Let's be clear, you're an Adrian Newey fluffer. Okay, you couldn't be more of a fanboy if you tried. Let's be clear about what truly happened for 2021. The sport changed the regulations. There was a completely different design philosophy for 2021 when there shouldn't have been. Okay, the new introduction of the regulations was supposed to be for 2022. Well, they're supposed to be for 2021, but they got set back a year due to, to COVID. But what they then did for 2021 was when it was supposed to be a continuation of we'll carry on using these cars. They changed things 
And what that did, those changes favoured the high rate cars, of which there were eight of them on the grid. Nui went about it his way. The rest of the cars copied, apart from Mercedes and Tracing Point, which became Aston Martin. They went about it their way and it was working for them. And they got seven consecutive, consecutive constructors titles with that car. Despite how great Adrian fucking Nui is, Mercedes got seven consecutive titles, right? And they got an eighth consecutive title, despite how amazing Adrian fucking Nui is, right? Oh, and now, oh, Nui persevered and he finally won. Well, they changed the fucking rules. And what you can't do is when they change the rules on you, when you're also putting half of your budget into the new car, which is the 2022 car, you can't afford a complete redesign of your car to make it high rake because the aerodynamic philosophies are completely different. You can't just jack your rear suspension up. So your car is like angled down the way the Red Bull car used to ride rather than flatter like the Mercedes used to ride. Just jacking your rear suspension up doesn't do it. The whole aerodynamic principle of how that car is creating its aerodynamic downforce changes completely. But what the sport did, it introduced new regulations that would favour that Red Bull design, favour Nui's design. And then Mercedes went, OK, we'll accept that and we'll rise to the challenge of still trying to compete, which they did. And you're trying to big up Adrian Newey. Unbelievable. All the other stuff they've got going on and the budget and everything else never opened their minds to building an Adrian Newey car for 2021. Part well, I've just explained why. Mercedes, why would, why, why would Mercedes want to build an Adrian Newey car for 2021? They've just won the last seven seasons. Outperforming Newey's car. Yeah, and then they've changed the regulations to suit Nui's car, and Mercedes can't afford to say, right, we've got to ditch the car that we've been using and just create a new car to replicate Nui's car just for this one season. We've got to use our own existing car, and we've got to try to make changes to that to enable that to catch the deficit, this advantage you've just handed to them because 2022 is a whole new Formula One anyway, and there's so much work to do. Yeah, and they had a car that won yet another Nui championship. Again. And I think that's a function of why they lost this year. There's no, you can't say they could have done it any better. And again, the way this, this lad articulates himself, oh, that's a function of why they've lost. That's a function of, fuck off. It's not at all why they've lost. They were cheated. They won the Constructors' Championship. They went into that final race. Level on points. Lewis Hamilton avoided getting taken out in Brazil, in Saudi. First lap of Abu Dhabi because Max would have taken him out to win that championship. Oh, not, not replicating a Adrian Newey car is a, is a function of the reason Mercedes lost. Fluffer. Perhaps. And I think they certainly got a big help from Pirelli halfway through the year with a stiffer rear. But... Uh, there's no question in my mind that this championship belongs as much to Adrian and his team, designers, engineers at Red Bull, and to Jonathan Wheatley and the guys on the ground who make these great calls. Uh, they make these great calls. Right. Overall, Red Bull strategies are better because Mercedes are poor. Uh, the Red Bull manipulation at the end is disgusting. The rule breaks that they uh, lie to you about as being interpretations of rules, they're, they're blatant cheats. And we're going to strip that all apart and expose that because that's something else I've just seen recently on Twitter. Anyway. Uh, as it does to Max, who's driven brilliantly all year, given where he's come from, given who he is, and, and given, given how good he is. I mean, he's right up there with Lewis. The interesting thing is... That he's right up there in Lewis. You've just told us that it's now the Nui car, okay, that Mercedes won the championship, but it's the Nui car. Max's car was three to four kilometres an hour faster on the straights. He was handed the title, but Max is still right up there with Lewis, yeah? Okay. He wasn't as quick as Lewis. Having lost the start, he 
made a bit of a suicidal plunge at the end of the straight on the first lap. A lot more grip under braking, he got the toe from Lewis, went down the inside. Uh, Lewis braked pretty late for Lewis and he's on the racing line and Max goes down the inside and you can see he's thinking again it is look if we touch championships over and I'm world champion yeah funny that isn't it if we ch touch championships over and I'm world champion what did he do in Brazil drove Lewis off the track if we touch championships over and I'm world champion drove Lewis off the track in Saudi brake tested Lewis in Saudi if we touch Championships over. Iron on world champion. Did the same in Abu Dhabi. Filthy. And he goes in and doesn't even make an attempt to turn the wheel to the left for the hairpin until he's two thirds of the way through the corner and Lewis goes off and, um, and, and, and continues to hold the lead. And at that point, Jonathan Wheatley got twice on the radio, I think, to Michael to say, you know, this is completely wrong. How come Lewis is still leading the race? We made a clean pass. Well, it wasn't a clean pass. You make a clean pass. There you go. So Red Bull on the radio inciting the crazies, hyping up the Red Bull strap-on fanboys going, oh, yeah, Lewis went off track there. He's got to give that back. He's got to give that back. This is the Red Bull tactic. This is the Red Bull tactic. They started it in Bahrain. They continued that through the vilification of Lewis Hamilton at Silverstone. It is the filthy Red Bull tactic where they've incited the crazies and created the hate. They're filthy bastards. They are filthy bastards. Now, new, sorry, the way Windsor describes this in terms of is it, it, the Verstappen overtake, it, it, it's how it should be. Why is the world's uh, F1 viewers not explained that this is not a valid form of overtaking? So if you take the corner and you're on the inside, you don't make a clean pass by just going straight on and then turning the wheel at the last minute. And that's, you know, that was... I mean, that's the, that's the bad side of Red Bull. There's a lot of that going on. You know, we were robbed sort of thing, but it was over aggressive and on borderline acceptable driving anyway, in my view. So what you've done, you've... Uh, everybody does it this way. Everybody presents in a way where, oh, yeah, it's, you could argue it was acceptable, well, it wasn't, it's borderline. Just call it out for being wrong. It's plain, simple that it was fucking wrong. You're not allowed to drive like that. It's dangerous. There are rules of engagement. That is, at the recognised braking zone for that corner, if you're not halfway alongside, if you've not earned the right to be in that overtaken position, you've got to yield. You don't own that corner. You've got to back out. You've got to brake harder and get yourself, took yourself in and not impede that other car. Red Bull don't do that. They lick the stem, stamp and send it. They give it the full send. And the fucking strap on, boys. They love that. The drive to survive, kids. Oh, yeah. That's fucking exciting. No, no. Call it out for being wrong. Uh, and that's not only Max. That's the whole thing at Red Bull in 2021. You know, it's Max. It's his dad, Joss, who's always been an aggressive guy. It's the Nelson PK influence coming in, you know, on a personal side with Max. And Nelson, we know about Nelson. And, and it's also the whole Christian Horner, Helmut Marco thing, which is, you know, Max Verstappen is a better racing driver than Lewis Hamilton. Yeah, OK. That's what... Yeah, OK. And, and that's true. In terms of, let's, let's be clear. Prior to 2021, going into Abu Dhabi, what are we? Lewis Hamilton, seven-time world champion, 103 race wins, about 103 poles as well. Um, pretty much every other record in the sport. And you've got Horner picking up this kid that had won, what, 15 to 20 Grand Prix at that stage? No world championships. And you've got Horner saying, oh, this guy's better than a seven-time world champion that's won 103 Grand Prix. Fuck off, Horner. What they think. Um, and I probably sound a little bit down at the moment. I'm down because it was, wasn't a straight fight, in my view. It was an incredibly nail-biting, exhausting race to watch. And it's kind of odd when the guy that's dominated the race made a great start from the dirty side of the grid on hard tyres, loses it on the last lap, not because he's made any mistakes at all. And that's what this race has to be seen 
as from Lewis's point of view. I think the, the other interesting point about all this is that Max Verstappen seems to be a much more popular driver now than Lewis Hamilton and Red Bull seem to be a lot more popular than Mercedes. I say popular, I'm kind of just, you know, going by the noise out there, the white noise out there on the internet, the grandstands, everything else. I mean, you don't... What a load of bullshit. Oh, yeah. This England versus France World Cup final that I was talking about where because it was being played in England and uh, the referee wrongfully awarded England a penalty because he's corrupt. Um, but the interesting thing is, um, in, in, in football now, England seem to be a more popular team than France. Fuck off. Popularity has nothing to do with it. It's sport. It's what is right. We shouldn't be considering popularity. It's not a fucking beauty contest. Oh, but it is, isn't it? Because it's a global marketing roadshow. And all we care about is popularity and image as opposed to integrity. As opposed to integrity. It's this veneer. It's this facade. If people like that, then people will buy it. If people don't like what they hear or see, then, oh, that jars them a little bit. So we have to give people what they want. It's all about popularity. I hear Max getting booed very much. I hear Lewis getting booed a lot. Why is that? I have absolutely no idea. I don't see anything in Lewis that deserves a boo at all. Equally, I see a lot in Max that's um, to be acclaimed. And so I think that is something that's been a difficult... Equally, you see a lot in Max that's to be acclaimed. Right. So what do we know about Max to, that's to be acclaimed? Is he a good role model? Is he a decent human being? Not seeing that. Does he perform illegal manoeuvres that shouldn't be tolerated in the sport of Formula One? Yes. Has he been boosted by the entire sport? Yes. He's fast. He is a title contender. But... Is he of the same level as Lewis Hamilton? No, he's not. You know, there's, there's, there are aspects that desire, uh, deserve recognition in Verstappen, but there's a lot of aspects which aren't good. Fault. Difficult thing for Lewis and Mercedes to deal with, and I think they've done a really good job. If you bear in mind that pressure alone, they've done a really good job uh, fighting that as well. So, yeah... I really, I mean, I'm, I'm recording this very soon after the race, the, the podium ceremony is still on. And I, and I feel kind of numb, I think. I think it's great that Max is world champion. I will forgive you on the grounds that when you're doing an initial reaction, um, you know, you need to process some things, which is often why I don't do a knee-jerk reaction to certain things. I take the time to have a bit of a think about it before jumping in to make a comment about it. But I just want to re I'll just re rewind that just before I stopped it. I should have stopped it a bit too early. Kind of numb, I think. I think it's great that Max is world champion. He deserves it. And I think it's great that Max is world champion. He deserves it. Here we go again with the Max Verstappen fully deserved bullshit. Here we go. Let's just uh, replay this. Let's replay this because again that graphic that was coming. I think I think it's great that Max is world champion. He deserved it, and he will win more world championships. And I've been saying he's a potential world. Max deserves his title. He's been great since the STR days. We he wasn't great. He showed promise, but it wasn't great. He crashed far too often. Uh, that's why he earned the nickname Chris Stappen. Okay, that that doesn't just get given to somebody for no reason, right? Um, but this notion of deserving, you don't deserve it. You accomplish it by by achieving the required criteria. That was that was gifted to him through a rule break. That's not deserving. But this is what the entire sport has done, is validated it. World champion since the day he was 
in at Toro Rosso, let alone Red Bull. Um, and I've congratulations to Joss and to everybody uh, in the Verstappen family because they've done an immense job. You'll see across the sport, there'll be some drivers that really, when Schumacher first came and drove a Jordan, you could see that very first race, the way he qualified that car, the way he did, um, boosted that Jordan up to a position that where you're just like, whoa, where's that come from? You didn't really see that necessarily with Verstappen. Over a period of time, you're like, yeah, this, this could look like he could be quick, but he's still making a lot of mistakes because he's young. So it wasn't the same as what you've seen drivers burst into Formula 1 with. Lewis Hamilton, OK, he was in a McLaren, which was a competitive car in his first season, but he should have been world champion in his first season. That was the impact Lewis Hamilton had. Max Verstappen wasn't that. He wasn't that. But I also think Lewis has done an incredible job. And I, you know, to me, the much maligned Lewis Hamilton now, it's kind of weird that you've got people like Horner saying he's not as good as Max Verstappen. I think he proved today that he's every bit as good as Max Verstappen, if not better than... Lewis proved today that he's every bit as good as Max Verstappen. What the fuck are you talking about? What the fuck are you talking about? As good as Max Verstappen. Weird. And I, you know, to me, the much maligned Lewis Hamilton now, it's kind of weird that you've got people like Horner saying he's not as good as Max Verstappen. I think he proved today that he's every bit as good as Max Verstappen, if not. Lewis proved today, despite the fact he's got seven world championships and 104 Grand Prix wins, because he won Abu Dhabi, he's got eight world championships because he won that one as well. But today, Lewis, on the day that the sport robbed him out of his eighth world title and 104th Grand Prix wins, oh, it's only today that he's proved that he's every good as bit as every bit as good as Max Verstappen, who's won fuck all. Really, fucking get some sort of perspective. And yet, this is the thing, right? This is why I get annoyed: is that these people present themselves with this veneer, right? This it, veneer of having fucking knowledge and having uh, expertise, and they they articulate themselves like that. Oh, yes, but you see, uh, Lewis proved today that he's uh, every bit as good as Max Verstappen. And people began, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, because Max is the benchmark now. Fuck off. Better than Max. Um, he, he really drove well on those medium tyres at the start of the race to pull away from Max on the soft tyre. And I can imagine what Lewis is feeling. I suppose that's why I'm feeling a bit odd, because I think, you know, you cannot take the human element out of this. And I can only imagine what Lewis must be feeling now, completely and utterly gutted, having driven the perfect race to beat this amazingly quick racing driver in this beautiful Red Bull car, which started on the... Oh, the beautiful Red Bull car. If Adrian knew he was there, you'd be, uh, yeah, I'm not going down that right route. Soft tyre uh, from the pole, and he did everything he needed to do to win it, and yet he lost it on the last lap due to some, if you like, bureaucratic mess. So, yeah, um, I'll have more thoughts. A bureaucratic mess. He was robbed. It was an illegal resumption to racing. It cannot stand. The rules of this, this sport dictate you cannot separate out just two races in a Grand Prix to set up a race off between two cars, neglecting the chances of all of the competitors. Do you not understand that? Expert of the sport, Peter Windsor. I think going forward from here, but that's my initial reaction to this race. Congratulations to Max. He's a complete star and he'll be a very worthy world champion. I think he'll be a very good world champion too, in the sense that he will bring Formula One to a new crowd, to a new audience. And then audience, well, they've been indoctrinated and they, many of them, I say many of them, there's a pr pr proportion of them that behave like utter wankers, the absolute shitheads of society. But, you know, let, let, let's keep them happy. Let's please the wankers, OK? Keep them wanking away to Formula One because they like that. And he will, and he's a, and he's a driver, he's a human being of um, great quality. And he's a human being who loves the sport. And I think that intensity will be um, obvious. Oh, Max is a human being. So therefore, we should like him. That's a good reason, isn't it? 
the guy is a prick. You can tell in his conduct. He's a prick. He's a self-centred prick. Doesn't give a fuck about anybody else. Oh, but he's a human being. In his reign as champion. I think for Lewis, it's a really interesting situation now because he isn't... Uh, oh, it's, this is going to be really interesting. This is the way that these like talking heads present themselves. Oh, let's be let's talk about these talking points, which could be really interesting. World champion anymore. He's won seven and he almost won eight. I suppose at this point we should also think of Michael. Lewis got so near to breaking Michael's record and he hasn't done it. Will he have another chance in 2022? Of course he will, because he's racing. He was robbed for Mercedes, but it's a very, very different Formula One in 2022. And I think the client... Because they've made the Adrian Newey formula. Let's make a new set of rules for designing the cars. Uh, who has shown in the past that they've got experience of this type of aerodynamic effect? Oh, this guy over here. Let's base the rules on his level of expertise about that form of aerodynamics. Cars will be a lot closer. There'll be less difference between a Mercedes and a Red Bull and a Ferrari next year. Well, it should be in theory. No, take Ferrari out of that because it's still the same engines, isn't it? But Red Bull... Oh, so it's, it's not going to favour Red Bull. And, and, ...and Mercedes will still be very, very close. So he may not have as good a chance as this again to win his eighth championship. But in closing, I just got to say, I think any racer with, you know, real feel in his veins would be feeling for Lewis right now and any racer who enjoys watching a fast aggressive on the limit any racer right I'm not a racer I am a person that follows the sport I don't have to be a racer I just believe in integrity I believe in what is right because without that in the world what do we descend into? You stand up for what is right. There are clear parameters that define what is acceptable and what isn't, what is right and what is wrong. And what happened was wrong. So you challenge that. I don't need to be a racer, but if you're a racer, you'll understand it differently. The racing driver will be very pleased that Max Verstappen has won the World Championship. So. Congrats to him. Congrats to Red Bull. If you're a racer, you'll be, be, be so what, what, if you're a racer, what? You don't give a fuck about integrity? All you care about is the full send. No, that's not, it. that's not even being a racer, is it? Because if you're actually a sportsman, you, you strive to be, you strive to accomplish winning, accomplish what it takes to win within the rules of the sport. Otherwise, what's the value of your achievement if you've had to cheat to to beat competitors that are conducting themselves within the parameters of the rules of the sport? Well, it's, it's, it's not a victory, is it? Because you've done something that you're not allowed to do in order to get a trophy. Well, that trophy is worthless then. And Honda, shouldn't forget Honda, pulling out of Formula One now as a factory team. Reminds me of the conversation, as brief as it was, I had with Helmut Marko when they were still with Renault engines, Red Bull that is, we were in Malaysia and uh, Honda were going nowhere with McLaren at that point and I waited in line to have a long three second discussion with Helmut Marko and I said, Helmut, just from my own experience at Williams, you guys should switch to Honda immediately. There will be a bit of a learning curve, but you'll do a much better job of managing Honda and turning it into a winning engine. And he said, this is the most ridiculous decision, ridiculous idea I've ever heard in my life. No, oh, out of my office. So that was that. And it didn't happen for another 18 months. But, you know, what can you say? So, yeah, congrats. There you go. Affirm your expertise there, Winter. OK, and like I say, as you're involved in the sport, you do have experience. And you will be party to things that the rest of us won't be party to. But you then present yourself as this knowledgeable person. And you're still coming out with a lot of fluff. And you're not drilling down to the crux of the matter. To the Popularism. Stay popular, Peter. You get 170,000 subscribers. You get people liking what you have to say because you don't offend the Max fans. You don't offend the Lewis fans. You get everybody 
and therefore you make videos that make you money. Wonder what's going on there. Winners, commiserations to the losers. Were they losers? They just didn't win it, did they? Lewis and Mercedes, they lost it on that last lap of the last race. See you soon. Because they were robbed. Because they were robbed. Because it should never have happened. It should have been a safety car finish. You missed out the bit that the regulations state because you're able to get 48.12 out. This is this is like so you've just saying I'm doing this as a gut reaction uh, video. Uh, they're still doing the podium. Right. But you're still able to get 48.12 out. You're still able to get that one out because you quoted 48.12 in this video. And you didn't read the bit which says the safety car will return to the pits at the end of the following lap. Or maybe the edit edited that bit out because that was too controversial. Right? But that bit there defines that that should have been a safety car finish. But we didn't touch upon that, did we? We didn't touch upon that. So what we get is the validator. The validator. So all the fans that come on here... Their attention is drawn away from the fact that this categorically should have been a safety car finish. And the fact that it's not makes it corrupt. OK, you've drawn attention away from that and you've validated Max because Max has been this incredible thing ever since the Toro Rosso days where we could all recognise that Max was this next best thing. And he fully deserved it. See, another validator. Somebody that present is presented to the world, but the world sees as this expert, just a validator. That will do for this one. There'll be more to come because I'm going to break down some more of his fluff. Because, like I say, you know, this, this Windsor, there'll be the occasion, there'll be some things that he says which you're like, okay, that's that's valid, that's that's decent enough. But he'll get he'll get on there with uh, Cameron F1, and they'll have this. Um, this little discussion and, and present to the world, we're having this discussion using our combined knowledge about these talking points in Formula One. It's all bullshit. All bullshit. And yet people can look at that and think that they're watching something that's going to give them some sort of education. Bollocks. But you like the way that Peter talks because Peter articulates his himself in a manner which convinces you that he's authentic and he's knowledgeable. And therefore... In your heads, he's the person to believe. And anybody that gets a bit pissed off and identifies it as bullshit, oh, oh, this guy, this guy, he doesn't know what he's talking about, does he? There you go. It's what you've been conditioned to uh, believe in people. People, Oh, they can see both sides of the argument. They can see that, uh, oh, on this hand, there's this. But on the other hand, there's this. No, no, no. Some of us, we can see all that, but we can dismiss the bullshit. Anyway, until next time, see you soon.